încă puțin. Acum ar trebui să fim deja live pe Facebook. Perfect, minunat. Dacă ai putea tu să preiei în acest moment și de screen sharing, va fi grosat. Da, imediat. Gata. Perfect. And then I will slowly switch to English. Slowly or not so slowly. Abruptly switch to English. Um, and welcome our participants and our viewers from Facebook. We will start in a minute. And because we have just discussed that we will try to uh, start on the dot. <laughs> um, while waiting for other participants, I will just try to Um, I will just try to have a brief introduction to this webinar today. Well, I, I do hope that everybody is able to hear me and also see us. So let's officially start. Um, so a big welcome again to all our participants here and to our viewers on Facebook. I am Elena Coman from Associația TechSoup and I will introduce you to our, very shortly introduce you to our subject today on how to organize and run one-on-one -on -one mentorship programs for teachers. Um, just as a kind reminder to everyone here and on Facebook that these capacity building webinars we do these days are created by the Romanian American Foundation in partnership with the US Embassy in Bucharest and with us at Associația TechSoup. Uh, in our short presentation today we will try to touch upon um, this subject of online mentorship what it means to adapt teachers' mentoring to keep it effective while moving online, the limitations and the benefits of online mentorship. Um, and we will do all this with our wonderful, wonderful guest, Karen Cater, President and CEO of Digital Promise and the leading voice for transforming American education from technology, innovation and research. Karen has served as a director of the Office of Educational Technology at the U.S. Department of Education, where she led the development of the 
2010 National Education Technology Plan and focused a lot on teacher support. She also directed Apple's leadership and advocacy efforts in education. So we're extremely grateful and also lucky to have her with us today. And a huge thank you for this has to go to the U.S. Embassy in Bucharest and to the U.S. Department of State for facilitating this talk. So Karen, thank you once again for being with us today. Um, I give you the floor and I'm here, of course, for any technical support that you might need and any um, questions that might arise. Well, thank you very much. And I will start by um, by saying I apologize for not speaking Romanian, but I very much appreciate everyone um, being able to listen in English. Um, we will, uh, I'll talk about a few things and then hopefully we'll have time for some conversation. Um, so I will share my screen if somebody needs to unshare their screen first. Yeah, there we go. Yes, you can you. share your screen now. All right. So today we'll talk about how we do think about supporting teachers online. And um, the good news is, is there are some great tools and great ways to do that. Before I thought I would give you just a very quick overview of what Digital Promise is. So at Digital Promise, uh, hold on one second, I'm gonna move this. Ah. Um, our vision is that all people at all stages of their lives have access to learning experiences that help them to acquire the knowledge and skills they need to thrive and continuously learn in an ever-changing world. Because we deeply believe that when everyone has access and everyone participates and everyone learns, we'll all benefit from a more engaged, informed, and just society. So our mission at Digital Promise is to spur innovation, to improve the opportunity to learn through technology and research. We believe in kind of these four powers. We believe in the power of networks, connecting people together. We believe we're stronger together, the, we're smarter together. Um, we can solve challenges when we work uh, with one another. We also believe in the power of story. And as we think about coaching, we think about the stories of the teachers. We think about what's, what their challenges are. Um, telling stories many times will help. Um, incite uh, or incentivize uh, actions. We also believe in the power of research to ground us in, in reality, to make sure we're not making things up, to look at evidence. And then we also believe in the power of, of powerful learning experiences, students engaged, teachers engaged, leaning forward, uh, solving problems together, learning how to think critically, research, and the like. So today we'll talk a little bit about what's happening um, with, with COVID, with the, with the school closures. We'll talk a little bit about technology and education and then how that affects uh, teachers. And then we will have time obviously for questions and comments and your ideas as well. So we all across the globe are dealing with this, this global pandemic um, that has caused unprecedented school closures. Schools have closed, students quickly went home overnight and teachers had to quickly decide and figure out how to support students, either with packets of paper or with technologies, and many times with virtual connections, either through telephones, old technologies, or video conferencing like we're doing today. But this was unprecedented, and we were lucky because technology offered huge opportunities um, for us to continue learning as students went home. But what we realized very quickly is there were many gaps. There were gaps in access to the internet at home. There were gaps in who had devices. There were gaps in digital literacy, who knew how to use the technologies, both in the teacher, teacher force and, the, and with students and their families. We also knew that there were gaps in the use of technology, how to use it meaningfully for learning. So, why are we even talking about technology? And I want to kind of spend a little bit time on this slide because I want to kind of make the point that when we're thinking about how technology supports coaching and mentoring and supporting teachers online, we start by thinking like, what is, why do we use technology anyway? How does technology support lifelong learning? How is it different than books and paper and, and um, other kinds of things that we've been doing? 
So the very first one is that it supports local and global participation and connection. The fact that we can be here today online talking together, we can see each other, we can have a conversation. Um, that is something that I think everybody has realized overnight, the power of technology to make connections and for teachers to connect with their students, for mentors and coaches to connect with their teachers, to support each other using video conferencing is, uh, has, has proven to be extremely helpful. The second is that there is that you have access with technology on the internet to lots of primary source documents, data, books in the public domain, all sorts of things that will support people and their learning. There are also so many examples of um, explanations on the internet, people explaining how to use a tool, how to do math, how to explain a concept. Students can use this, teachers can use this. We also know that technology supports assessment and feedback. Students can use a technology tool, get rapid feedback, know whether they're getting the right answer, the wrong answer, where they're going wrong, um, and the technology can adapt to their, to their learning. This is the same thing with teachers. Teachers can provide um, a video perhaps of something that they're doing or a practice, and they can get rapid feedback um, online. We also have, um, we know that every single person, regardless of their age, has access to professional tools. If they have a device, they have the ability to write, they have the ability to produce video, to produce um, animations, music. Um, these professional tools, the tools the pros use, are in the hands of everyone. Access to experts, and this is really where, where mentors come in, where coaches come in, where other people come in. You have access to people who are expert in every topic under the sun. And so if a teacher needs supports, a coach or a mentor can help them find those experts that can help them. Um, accessibility. So if somebody is deaf, if somebody ha has vision problems, um, motor problems, the technologies can help them access the, the people and the materials and the resources, access each other. They, there are also so many translation technologies now. So if you do need to translate from one language to another, the technologies can support that. And finally, I think as we all know, technology supports personalized learning, the ability to, to meet somebody where they are and help them achieve and make progress. So these kinds of things are kind of why we're using technology anyway. But we know that technology alone is not enough to close the gaps. So the problem isn't simply taking technology and distributing it. We know that we have to provide professional learning and support to teachers so that they have the background and the know-how and the practices to be successful. So the very best news this spring as, as schools closed, we remembered, I think, that teachers are incredibly creative and resourceful. They solve problems every single day. They know how to address the needs of, of their students. We also found that the teachers in our networks that had coaches were by far the more successful and they had the, the access to someone that could help them problem solve and continuously, uh, continuously um, find new ways of meeting the needs of their students. So we're lucky, the teachers are creative, resourceful problem solvers, we can start there. We know that teacher quality is the most important factor in student achievement. So if we look at this graph, students that have high performing teachers get better and better. Students that have teachers that are not high performing have a, a, a much harder time uh, catching up to their peers. So having teachers with all the supports possible to help them meet the needs of every single one of their students is an incredibly powerful um, uh, asset. So supporting teachers, let's talk about this for a little bit and then we can have a conversation. So when we, one of the things that we have done is we have something called the Dynamic Learning Project and it's a coaching model. Um, and this is one process, right? So one of the things that we talk about is you should have a process. If you don't have a process, you'll sort of flounder around and probably have conversations, but really thinking about what you're trying to accomplish. So as we engage with teachers, we help identify one or more challenges to focus on. So teachers have many, many challenges, but selecting a challenge and then coming up with ideas or, or ways that you can could possibly solve that challenge, brainstorming ideas, investigating strategies, 
um, and then selecting one or more to try. Then trying those, implementing those, and the best cases are when they have when teachers then have support from their coach, from the people who are mentoring them, um, and then have the opportunity afterwards to reflect on that experience. So as teachers have gone home and try and gotten online and used video conferencing and other ways of supporting their students, those teachers who had a coach or a mentor that could come up alongside them, join them in their classroom online, help them. Um, work together uh, with the students and then reflect with the teacher and, and continuously improve. That's the, the powerful process that we like to use. There are so many different interactions that you can have. You do have one-on-one -on -one time, formal meetings when you get together, you sit down together online probably today, um, and you have a formal meeting. You, you have a process, you're working through something together. There also are informal conversations, someone who picks up the phone and can call you, say, this is what happened, this is what I need help with, kind of informal conversations. Or you might say, I found something that would be helpful to this teacher, I'm going to quickly send them a note. So these informal interactions are obviously helpful as well. The third I mentioned is the classroom observation, right? So if you are invited into a teacher's classroom, you can model with them, you can co-teach with them, you can teach a, a class and have the teacher observe. Lots of different ways to do that. But when we find that um, that the, a coach or a mentor is invited into the classroom, and in this case, we're talking about a virtual classroom with the teacher, that's when they can provide the most helpful feedback and can be as connected to that teacher as possible. Coaches and mentors also can share with each other. They can say, I'll I'll create a professional development and, uh, opportunity for teachers on one topic, and another coach or mentor can create something on another topic, and they can cross and share. And then obviously, uh, professional learning communities, finding those professional learning communities that will help your teachers. Um, you can set them up yourselves, or you can find them. There are so many communities online on all sorts of topics um, and help teachers uh, connect uh, with each other again, networks solve problems. So the characteristics, and, and you probably all know this already, becoming a relationship builder, that is by far the most important thing, knowing how to create those relationships. The second is an insider. That means somebody who knows the teacher, knows the school, knows the setting, knows the students in many cases, somebody who isn't a stranger to the teacher's context, the place that the teacher is in fact teaching, the community. Someone who's a strong communicator, both orally, in writing, um, body language, all of the ways that you communicate effectively. Someone who is not scared of the technology, someone who can help teachers use technology and, and continuously improve, know that sometimes things go wrong. Um, hopefully that won't be on this particular uh, webinar, um, but know that things go wrong and, and becoming a, a kind of a, a support um, with regard to the technology. And then also if you are an experienced teacher, that's helpful. It, it creates a sense of trust. And when we talk about trust, it is knowing the situation, knowing the students, knowing the teacher, having compassion. So many teachers today also have their own children at home. They have other situations. They may have health um, things that they're worried about. So knowing their situation, having compassion, building those relationships is the very most important. Asking good questions, having a bank of questions, continuously collecting your own uh, questions and the way the questions that you find. Um, help most, um, that's an important thing. Keeping, your, keeping a bank of questions that you can use and then obviously listening to the answers. Goal setting is a in, very important tool with teachers, setting goals, agreeing on how you're going to get there. Um, looking at data and student work together. Again, the, the teachers who are trying to solve something, they're trying to teach their own students if they have someone who can look at the student work and help problem solve, help decide how to help students do better or achieve or learn the next um, concept, uh, that, is, that supports the teachers as well. Taking a risk, trying something new, and all of us are trying new things in this 
uh, in this time of, uh, of school closures. Everybody's trying new things, giving teachers permission to take risks, to try something. And if a teacher knows they have you standing next to them or have, have you supporting them, um, that gives them courage. Celebrating the successes, celebrating what's happening, what's learning, what, they're, what they are learning, what their students are learning, encouraging practice. Make, they can practice with you. They can practice if they're not comfortable getting on a video conference, they can practice um, ahead of time um, and learn how to use their own technologies. And then helping them make connections um, with other people. So the tools of the trade, the tools of techn the technology tools that we're using, video conferencing, obviously, there are really interesting tools online. We used one called Mural this week, which is a sticky note board. And you can use those kinds of things to brainstorm together, to move things, to solve challenges, um, and to, to share a workspace online. The obvious and the most common um, sharing online is through documents keeping journals, keeping reflections, sharing those. Um, you can also give audio feedback and video feedback that you can include in these, in these documents. You can record something so that you're actually talking, talking out loud with the, with the teacher. And again, the tools of professional learning communities. So there are a few resources on this slide um, that we can that I, I mentioned. I was actually doing some research and I found a great blog post from uh, just a, a month or so ago um, called EdTech in Romania. And it has many, many resources um, that probably are relevant uh, to you. Um, we also have some um, research and resources at two of our websites, the Dynamic Learning Project, and also at a project called the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools. And then there's a link to Mural, which is the one digital shared workspace um, that I shared with you. So as Andrea says, the quality of education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And that's where you all come in. Thank you very much. So I'm going to unshare my screen so that we can um, so that we can have a conversation. Thank you so much, Karen, for this presentation. Thank you. Uh, just to answer a question that is already coming up on our chat, of course, we will share with you uh, the resources that we will receive from Karen. Um, so I invite you all to ask questions, as many questions as possible, while we have Karen with us. And I will... Um, I will start with, I have to, Karen, if, I, if I'm if i allowed. Am I allowed to also have two questions? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, because uh, I, think it, I think it's important, and I, I've now wrote it down, something that you said, that uh, you need a process in the coaching and the mentorship. Otherwise, it's just a, otherwise it's just a conversation. And I see that the coaching cycle, every time, uh, uses reflection as a way to, you know, to build upon everything that's happening. So if you could share with us maybe a couple of insights on what a good reflection process mm. and a reflection conversation might look like, I think yeah. that would be very valuable. Yeah, as if, if, if you've gone through the whole process, then by the time you get to reflection, you can reflect back on what what was, let's remember what the original challenge was. So let's think about that original challenge. We set a goal to try to do something to solve this challenge. What worked and what didn't work? So there's kind of three questions that I always like to use. It's like, what was the purpose? What was good and what was missing? So it's, it's kind of an easy way to, um, to focus on the positives, like think about what actually worked, because I always believe that you can move forward more easily from a position of strength and, and uh, positive reinforcement. Um, I think probably everybody who's a teacher knows that, and that that's a better way to support children as well. Um, but that's, I think that that's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's what, you know, what was the purpose, uh, what was good, and what was missing? And then what would we do next time? You also can try the same thing again. Um, so you can kind of use the same challenge and either try something else or try the same thing and, and do it a little bit differently. So there are, um, 
you know, there are multiple ways, but those are kind of the simple questions for reflection. Elena, could you please unmute yourself? Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Beginner's mistake, thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, and also, Karen, I was thinking about uh, what what would you say? You know, there are a lot of teachers, but uh, not always uh, enough mentors and coaches. What would you say as a let's say an effective ratio yeah. of uh, teachers per coaches or per mentors that you think? would be as effective as possible that would give the the most the, the best results so we've done some research on that and we've we've come up with 10 a 10 to 1 ratio but that means at one time right so you mm -hmm. we a lot of our work we sort of do in like eight week cycles so you can work with a, a group of teachers say 10 teachers for eight weeks and go through the the process a few times with with all of those teachers and then you can pick up new teachers or you can keep the same group of teachers throughout the year there's there's no hard and fast rule but it is true that a, a smaller group is um, you're able to get to know them more and really support them through that process but that's for a very um a very um uh, more intensive process you are really helping uh, teachers um, in their classroom, not just talking with them. If you're just having conversations or formal uh, or formal and informal meetings, you probably could work with more. But if you are actually working with them in their classroom, in their virtual classroom, in their online classroom, um, ten is seems to be a, a number that works. And while we are on the research thing, you probably probably have an overview of how long such a process could uh, could take such a coaching process for it to be effective and really affect changes in the in the practice of the teachers so yeah and and what we have uh, landed on is eight weeks eight week mm -hmm. an eight week cycle um, and we actually do one of the things that we have um, and these are available online as well mm -hmm. are um, uh, a sur we do surveys at the end of every coaching cycle. So if one cycle is eight weeks, at the end of that cycle, we give a survey to all the teachers and the results of that survey help the coach get better and better, right? What worked for the teacher? What would you change? You know, um, what do you, you know, wish we had more time for? And those kinds of things help the coach get better and better and better at um, their in interactions with, with teachers. So. That's helpful as well. We call it data for continuous improvement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, we'll have a, we already have the first questions and I will uh, I will try to, to read them and invite our participants to address us more. So I have a question from Bianca who asks us, how do you manage not to let compassion lower, lower your expectations and expected results from the teachers you work with? And I appreciate that does happen in uh, vulnerable communities. I mean, it is, mm -hmm. that's a great question. I'm not sure how you, um, I've never thought actually of compassion getting in the way of expectations. I think compassion isn't just feeling sorry for someone and, and understanding their, their situation. It's, it's understanding someone and their situation and can and how and using that to help you help them get better. Um, most people, regardless of their situation, they they know they want to they want to teach their students well, they want to have high expectations of their own students, and having high expectations of the teachers um, is an important part of that. So I don't think compassion uh, should lower expectations. I think compassion helps you helps you help them meet their own uh, high expectations um, but that's a that's something I'll, I'll think more about I appreciate that question thank you and uh, we also have another question that uh, I noticed that many teachers are hesitant in embracing this change what mm -hmm. can the community provide to help these teachers transition towards digitizing their education you know, I use that's partly why I use have the one slide with the eight boxes that says here is the here's why we're using technology because many times people are sort of like why why are we using technology? You know, I 
paper and pencil is, is better or whatever. And it's not an either or. You don't have to say, throw everything else out and move to technology. Many teachers have their favorite art projects, their favorite you know, paper books that they love to read. All of that is great. And we know that in today, all students need to grow up being digitally literate, knowing how techno taking charge of the technology so it doesn't take charge of them. But I think that the most important thing a coach or a mentor can do is help lower the risk um, with teachers. If teachers are worried that the class will get away from them or, or students will, you know, that it will be a difficult environment to manage, um, then have the cha the challenge that you work on with teachers could be classroom management techniques when students are using technology. And you can help them identify what are the things that they are worried about. Um, so actually there's two parts. One, they might not believe that technology helps people learn. And that's why we use those that slide. Two, they might be worried that they won't be able to manage it. And then you can take that on as a challenge and help them identify management techniques that will work. Thank you. We, you talk about, and I, I think we, we, we don't talk about enough about classroom observation here in Romania and the importance of a good classroom observation process uh, while helping a teacher improve its, uh, its pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Um, and now, well, online education, you have to, you have to watch, you have to participate in virt virtual classroom observation that goes through entirely different other rules. So if you could, for example, if we could, uh, and this is the question that has come up, if we could discuss a bit about the key points, let's say the key issues that a mentor might observe during a let's say a normal class observation, an offline class observation, a regular yeah. classroom observation, but also what do you think needs to change when you're observing a virtual class? So classroom observations can be for multiple purposes. Um, many times, and actually one important thing about coaching and mentoring is that it shouldn't, you. In, and I don't know if this is in Romania, but in the United States we have, uh, evaluations, teachers get evaluated. And so maybe a principal or someone comes in to observe the teacher and then they evaluate them. And, and that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about um, observations for helping the teacher um, solve a problem or, or get better at their, at their job. Um, so that's a very important thing that the coach and the mentor is not evaluating the teacher. So what, they, what the teacher, what the coach can do as they're in the classroom is they can be looking at multiple things and this can be agreed upon with the teacher ahead of time. So the teacher might ask the coach to come in and watch a particular student and say, I can't figure out how to help this student sit still or I can't figure out how to help this student um, do their math or whatever it is, whatever it is that they're trying to do. Um, so it may be that the teacher that the coach is there to watch a particular student. It may also be that the coach is there to um, maybe collect a certain kind of data. So for example, if a, t if a coach is running a seminar or with, if they're hosting, if they're, if they're having a discussion with their students, one of the practices is that the teacher shouldn't respond to every student, right? So if a teacher wants to run a better discussion, it isn't that the student says something and then the teacher says something and then the student says something and then the teacher says something. Instead, you want the teacher to speak and then, and then a student to speak and then another student to respond to that student. So a coach can be in there observing and keeping track of, of who is speaking and how many times and kind of a data collection. And that is to support the teacher and then they can reflect on that afterwards. They can talk about you know, how that, how that went and maybe um, they can practice uh, what we call wait time, right? They can wait for more seconds before, they, before a, somebody else speaks up so that they're giving all students time to think. So that can be a second, a second thing that they can watch a student, they can collect data. Um, and then they also can be watching a, a, a 
classroom management technique to see if it worked. And then they can reflect on that with the, with the teacher afterwards. So there are all sorts of ways. The other thing I think is important is in many cases, um, the, the coach or the mentor might model a technique. So they might be the teacher in the classroom and the teacher sits back and observes and watches and sees how to, to see how the, how the coach might handle something. It might give them an opportunity to themselves watch a particular student from a different vantage point. The other thing is that the, the, um, the, they can co-teach. So this is, I think, powerful, especially now with going online, is that, is that a teacher and a, and a coach can teach together. They can, they can work together on something that they've agreed upon ahead of time. And that can be incredibly helpful um, for the teacher as well. So kind of three, three different ideas there. And all of those, I think actually all of this can be adapted for online. You, you, it's a different way to join a classroom, but you're still joining the classroom. And if you don't have video conferencing, you can help the teacher by, by looking at student work with them, seeing how the, teacher, how the students are doing and help the teacher come up with ways of helping individual students. Yeah, and we have a great follow-up question exactly for this topic. What do you would you say is uh, the relevant uh, relevant data that the coach mentor could collect during class observation? We you have mentioned a few of those, yeah. but if you can other kind more. of data. Um, I mean, they can count different things. They can count how many times an individual student speaks up. They can um, they can do you know <laughs> this is one of my favorite things to think about is that I walk in a classroom, I like to observe the engagement level of the students. So when I say engagement, it isn't laughing and playing, it's are they leaning forward? Are they concentrating on their work? Are they, are they trying hard? Or is what they have perhaps too easy or too hard or or not something that they can do. And so instead the student is disrupting or, or talking to somebody else you know, on the side. So they can be observing um, those kinds of things. The, um, I mean, there's, there's all, any, anything, there are all sorts of things. Once you decide what, to, what you're looking for in a classroom together with the teacher, you can determine like what, what would be evidence of, of something like that. But, Watching level of student engagement is one, definitely watching uh, uh, discussions and how students are, um, are working in classrooms. In, and I think this online, we'd have to think about this a little bit more, but in classrooms, you also, if students are using technology, the, the coach or the mentor can be also looking at student screens and seeing where they are and, you know, making sure students are following along or you know, in the appropriate places, not off somewhere else. Um, so lots of different kinds of information is available in a classroom as you're observing. And would you say that in an observation for improvement, uh, like, like this one, would you look only at the, let's say, at the challenges and the object objectives of the coaching process, or would you look in, in more of a general way at the entire class at the entire thing that the teacher is doing there? I think this is a place where it's really important to have that agreement with the teacher. Mm -hmm. um, if the teacher trusts you, I mean, they do trust you if they've invited you into their classroom, right? So that's another thing actually that we believe is it needs to be voluntary and not forced. Although in some cases it needs to be forced. If, it, if a teacher really needs help, <laughs> sometimes you need to make them have someone come in to help them. Um, but building that trust is important. But I, so I think that it's agreeing on what kinds of things you're going to watch. On the other hand, it also, one of the other reflection um, techniques is to use the I noticed, you know, as a start. I noticed this. I noticed this student. I noticed this part of your classroom. I noticed, um, you know, whatever it might be. So just kind of a noticing protocol. Um, is helpful as well. And then that opens the door for other kinds of things that you might not have been expecting to look at. Um, you're, you're expecting and you're, you're going in with the purpose of 
of the chat that using um, the information for solving the challenge, but you might also notice a lot of other things and having that as one of the one of the reflections is important as well. Thank you. And we also received a question that I, I feel that maybe I should have started with this. If you feel that is, is there a difference between mentoring and coaching? And what would that difference be in your view? Yeah, I I think for this purpose, for today, I sort of use the terms mm -hmm. interchangeably. Um, and so I don't actually, I, I apologize, I should have done a little more asking before I started this, uh, as I was preparing for this. Um, so I'm kind of using them interchangeably. We call them coaches. Sometimes a mentor is just simply a, a not someone who coaches the teacher actively on their profession, but rather gives them advice on different things. They, they help them, they listen and they help them make, um, uh, make changes. And it can be all sorts of topics. It wouldn't necessarily have to be just associated with their classroom practice. So I think probably we think of coaches more as helping teachers get better at their craft and mentoring more as helping a teacher with their, their own personal challenges, less about their students. But I, but I think they, I don't know, for the purpose of today, I've used mm -hmm. both of them. Today. But uh, anyway, so a good co coaching process starts with a good challenge. A mentorship process probably looks at the, at the teacher as a, you know, okay. as a whole. Um, and talking about good challenges and challenges to start with, you know, there, there are different uh, ages and uh, experience, mm -hmm. <laughs> experience ages <laughs> in the life of a teacher. So what would you say, for example, is a good, uh, is a good challenge to start with when you're a, when you're a, a beginner, yeah. a debutant teacher, let's say, as opposed, and also what, what would you say is an interesting challenge to give to an experienced teacher? Yeah, so these challenges come from the teacher. So it isn't that the coach is giving them a challenge, mm -hmm. it's they're, they're talking, they're together selecting something to work on. So I would say beginning teachers, it's a lot about classroom management, managing your students, managing, um, you know, getting everybody organized and, you know, um, even things like the flow of the classroom as students are standing up and walking around, there's, it was, there's just a lot of things associated with managing a classroom. Um, in an online environment, I've talked to many, many teachers who are now managing an online environment and students, I mean, it, it, it's very, very interesting um, if you have a classroom of students on a video conferencing like this. Um, and all of the behaviors and the different kinds of things. So it's, it's very different. So um, I think classroom management is for, for a beginning teacher or for a teacher new to a technology or something like that, that is important. Um, advanced teachers have also have challenges. And in many cases, it might be a particular student. They want someone to help them um, determine how best to meet the needs of a particular student. We work a lot on something called what we call learner variability. And it's a little bit broader than special education, but this is students who have special needs. So a teacher may be a very experienced teacher, but have a student in their classroom that has a particular um, learning difference or learning disability that they haven't actually worked with before. And so, so that can be something that a, a more experienced teacher would invite a coach in and together they might find uh, online expertise, someone, you know, somebody else somewhere, somewhere else that knows more about the topic uh, or the disability or the, or the, the, um, the variation in, for this student. So those are kind of examples of beginning and advanced challenges. And I have received a question that I know, I don't know how exactly how to interpret it that this way, but I will just address it. Uh, Laurentio asked us, what opportunities do you do exist for teamwork tasks and how can specific tools for this be used effectively? I, th mm. I think it's a question probably related. I will ask Laurentio to send us more details to understand it better, but I think it's a question related to the fact that usually in the online environment, uh, managing teamwork is 
way more difficult than doing it in a in a physical uh, mm -hmm. space but at the same time teamwork and teamwork tasks are really important in a in a classroom so yeah we have so uh this is common across the workforce now everybody has gone home and everybody is trying to figure out how to work in teams um, not everybody, but many people have teams that they usually see every day and now they're seeing them online. So some of the tools that work incredibly well, um, we use Zoom video conferencing, which is what we're using right now. The ability to put, to send people to small groups um, works extremely well. We ran a seminar the last two days on artificial intelligence in education and um, had very smoothly sent people to small groups of three people in a group, sent people to groups of, of 10 in some cases. So you can, you can determine using the tools of video conferencing, you can send people to small groups and give them um, a task and then have them come back. But that coupled with, using that with um, shared documents, is very important so students can be working together on a document we can you can have um, students who are um, that the tool that I shared called mural was something we also used the last few days and that's a, a, a sticky note you know using sticky notes and moving them around and that's a very nice shared digital workspace so tools like that are also really uh, helpful um, students we have found that students need to connect with each other. Um, many times students are home, they're, you know, they can't go out very much. Um, and so the te teachers have been facilitating uh, students to connect with each other, even not about school, right? even about you know, connecting together online or playing a game or something like that. So um, small group work, teamwork is, um, is you know really important and a lot of the tools will help will help facilitate that thank you yes teamwork especially in the online environment is a is a is a huge challenge we also have a question about uh, we also have a question about so we discuss about a lot about the uh, teachers that are coached or mentored <laughs> but what would you say so let how, how would you design a program for good coaches and good mentors? What would you say that are the main, apart from compassion, not necessarily the, 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 the qualities, but what would you say are the competencies that you would really focus on in a program of uh, building a good coach, yeah. a good mentor? Yeah, I mean, and um, so a couple things. One is, again, data collection, right? So have a way of getting information. Is this working? Is it not working? Um, how could this be better? Do you need more one-on-one -on -one time with your coach? Do you need, um, so listening to the people that are being uh, coached, um, that's, that's the most important thing. If you want to get better as a coach, listen to the people you are coaching and get their feedback um, they, they can they can help you. Um, I think that the other other kinds of things are being incredibly resourceful. Um, since there's not a sort of prescribed curriculum, since you are listening to the co listening to the teacher and and addressing their challenges, being resourceful, knowing how to go find resources that will help that teacher or find an expert on a certain topic that will help that teacher. Um, all those all those uh, all those ways of supporting the teacher where they are, um, I think that's in, that's in very very valuable uh, uh, to the teacher, um, and especially now again when people are trying new things every day, having somebody that they can count on to help them um, has proven to be very effective. Um, I saw that someone asked um, if if all teachers. Um, does every teacher have a coach or a mentor in the U.S.? Yeah. The answer is no. <laughs> they definitely do not. Um, we have two big projects. One was this big research project on coaching called the Dynamic Learning Project, and there's a lot of resources online there. The other project, um, and that was um, several hundred schools that we've worked with um, 
uh, and, and had coaches. In that program, actually in both of our programs, the other one is our Verizon Innovative Learning Schools program. In both of those, you have the teachers and every school has a full-time coach. So the coach works with the teachers in the school and then all those coaches have a mentor. <laughs> so it's a, it's a layered uh, process. So our job was to um, support the coaches in supporting their, their teachers. Um, so I think a, a part of that system is to also build a support for the people who are coaching. <laughs> and, and that can also be supporting each other. So having a professional learning community of all of you can also um, be a very good way of, of, of creating this system. Yeah, you have probably you have probably met a lot of good examples of uh, coaching relationships or coaching environments that have worked. Could you could you I don't know give us a bit of more details on the this project that you were running? Let's say how many, with how many coaches? What did the coaches do, or what? How, how did you support the coaches to do the work that they did? Yeah, um, one thing we did is we collected the data and then put it together in a visualization that was easy to share back with the with the schools. Um, we shared it with the with the coaches so that they could. Um, and then we our job was to work with the coaches and help them look at the data and help them determine how to how to improve. Um, again, having the coaches have this cycle, have a process, and the, the process isn't magic. Having any process, have a process that you can use over and over again, those are, it definitely helps because everybody knows what to expect. Um, I would say the places where it doesn't work as well is where the, the coach just sort of has a light relationship and kind of checks in like, hey, do you need anything? You know, can I help? Um, those very general questions, instead of like having a way of saying, let's talk about the challenges and having some ways of getting into that conversation. Many times it's hard for teachers to admit that they have a, a challenge or something that they're trying to get better at. Um, and so setting up that conversation so it isn't, um, so it's safe, so they can, you know, you, you can, a coach can, a coach. Actually, one other quick thing. A coach can also be very good at taking something learned in one classroom and bringing it to the next. And in our job, we could take something from one school and take it to the next. So again, connecting those people together, connecting the dots, being the, uh, the bee that flies from school to school and um, pollinates the <laughs> with good ideas, um, you know, that's, that's another uh, helpful, helpful piece. And I will just end with, because I, I, I thought about it while you were discussing that they have any process, but have a process is, is, is better. What would you say they are the, I don't know, the three things that you shouldn't do in a coaching or a mentorship relationship? Uh, break the trust. That's the most important thing. If a teacher has trusted you, um, you should, you should value that and not, uh, break that trust. And that means the working with the teacher on what they're trying to improve. But again, you're not evaluating them. You're not, um, providing information to a, the principal or somebody else who's in charge of that person. Now, obviously that that doesn't include any time that, you know, something is very important to tell somebody else about. But for the most part, keeping that trust is, is absolutely number one. The second is recognizing that every person wants to get better. Everybody wants to improve at their job um, and, and knowing, and them knowing that that's what you're there for. You're there to help improve and everybody can improve and kind of keeping it as a positive um, experience is number two. And number three is using data, using information so that you're not um, only using your own intuition or um, making sure that you're, you're using data. And so then it also is safer for the teacher to look at the data, to look at 
student work to look at examples so that um, uh, so that the the um, you know they they are looking at something and it's not as personal to them. It doesn't doesn't get inside of their their being and make them feel badly. Thank you. And I, while listening to you and talking about feedback process um, and not breaking this trust, I was curious, mm -hmm. as with the case with the reflection process, which needs to have some sort of questions, this feedback process between, uh, this permanent feedback process between coaches and teachers, because also teachers need to give some sort of feedback to, to coaches, is that if you would recommend a, uh, I don't know, some questions or some, yeah, some questions to, to guide it. To guide the feedback to the coaches? Yeah. yeah. What, what would, would be yeah. the questions that you would ask a teacher as a coach about your work, basically? Yeah, I mean, what I would, well, first of all, what I would ask a coach is um, what is working, again, what's working for you. And, and you can use the same process if you're coaching coaches, come up with a challenge. And for them, it might be a particular teacher's classroom, or it might be a, um, come, you know, designing new protocols or designing new questions, coming up with new questions. So those, the same process can be, can be used with, um, if, coaches are, if, I, if, I, if you're mentoring coaches. Um, so the same thing, you can use it, let's find it, let's select a challenge, let's figure out how to get better, let's collect data, um, look at the data together and, and determine you know, what kinds of changes or what you would do differently um, next time. It might be that you have something that you want to um, specifically uh, work with, the, with a teacher on and helping them, again, helping them find resources. It's, so it's the same cycle. And none of this is magic. It really comes down to people, building relationships, building trust, having methods for collecting data, surveys, observations, student work, the kinds of things that will give you the best information about what's happening and how to, how to uh, get better and better. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, I have wrote it down a lot of things for us to use also in our programs, because I think this insight into the need of uh, building basically a, a data enabled <laughs> observation and a data enabled coaching process, I think is really, really valuable. And I think uh, sometimes we don't look enough at the, the data, even if that may, data means surveys, even if that, that, that data means uh, observation uh, observation process and student work I've also I also have a lot of ideas to improve a bit our reflection per processes because for example I think uh, I think sometimes even in our own reflection process this idea of what was missing mm -hmm. sometimes is missing yeah. uh, sometimes we don't focus enough uh, enough on it so thank you so much. We have a lot of a uh, lot of things to start with, and thank you so much for the for the resources because everybody <laughs> asked for them. Yeah, um, just put them in the chat for everyone. For everybody who is listening here and on Facebook, uh, if you have any more questions, especially probably I expect to have more questions after you consult the resources, which is usually the case. <laughs> Once you get more information about it. Uh, don't forget that you can send us um, your questions over email and we'll try to do our best to send them to Karen if she might take a, just a quick look at them. Uh, and thank you all for uh, staying with us at uh, this uh, late hour in the afternoon in Romania and very early hour in the morning in the US. Um, a big thank you has to go for to our colleagues at the Romanian American Foundation and the U.S. Embassy in Bucharest and the and the U.S. State Department. This has been the second webinar in this series. More will follow soon, so stay with us on Facebook and uh, on social media, and we'll you'll hear from us soon. Thank you once again, Karen. Wishing you a wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much.